in their midst, trying to uh, sort of belittle Paul's ministry, his work, and his labor with the Corinthian church, and the word that he had established them in. And here he is admonishing them, and he is trying to move them into a place that they can see where they are at. It's important that we see where we are at in our walk with the Lord. We can't afford to just go about things in a nonchalant and careless way, you know, but we must be willing at times, Clint, to step back and hear the word of God and what it has to say to us. But Paul was admonishing the Corinthian church. He says in verse 5, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Uh, he admonished them to examine themselves, to prove themselves, and to know their own selves. Clint, he didn't tell them to uh, look at somebody else and tell what you think about where they are in their walk and the relationship with the Lord. But he admonished them to examine yourself. Know yourself. Prove your own self. Is Jesus Christ in you? When we talk about examining ourselves, it means to inspect someone or something in detail, to determine their nature or condition, to investigate thoroughly. There are times that if we're not careful, we're going through the emotions of things, Clint, and not really growing and gaining in our walk and our relationship with the Lord. That is dangerous ground to be walking on. But we've got to be, and it feels like something's gotten in my throat, excuse me. <coughs> but we've got to be willing to expect our own self in, in, in detail and determine where we are at in this walk with Christ. To prove means to establish the truth or genuineness uh, as by evidence or argument. To prove one's claim. To know means first-hand knowledge of states, situations, emotions, or sensations. Why was it so important? Why was Paul, why did he feel a need? See, Clint, he could see what was going on in the midst. He knew that they were be, being influenced evilly. And he could see that. And he said to them to examine, to know, to prove that Jesus, that they were in Christ Jesus. Why did he say that? Except ye be reprobate. We need to be willing. <coughs> Forgive me tonight. We need to be willing to examine ourselves. I got up this morning and I have a kind husband <laughs> and if he's getting, if he's ahead of the game before I'm ahead of the game, he'll iron my clothes for me. <laughs> well, he ironed my skirt for me and I had that black skirt this morning. And he said, Crystal, where's the lint brush? Because it was black and had lint all over it. And I said, well, it's in the laundry room, you know. He said, I looked, but I couldn't find it. So I went there and said, here it is. <laughs> it's right here. And he went. He took a lint brush to remove little fuzz balls and little things that had cleaned itself to that skirt. And he went. Because when he went to take the iron to it, he saw there were things there that did not need to be. He examined the cloth and the material, and he decided to do something about it. There was a need for the church at Corinth to examine themselves. There was a need for them to know their own hearts, their own walk, their own state with the Lord. They needed to prove their own selves. <laughs> when we talk about proving something, to see that it is true or genuine. We know in our court of law, you're innocent until proven 
child of God. It's more to it uh, than, you know, saying a little prayer. We talk about this morning about putting our trust in God, being fully convinced that what he has promised, he is able to do. <laughs> That's what we're talking about, about putting our trust in the Lord. No matter what it is, no matter what the need is, what the situation is, that we know that what God has said, what he has promised, he is able to do. We live in a world that needs to be able to see people who are walking in Christ Jesus, not professing, not people proclaiming, but people who trust in the Lord. I feel like sometimes that's where we're falling short at today. The Bible says that if the salt has lost its savior, it is good for nothing but to be cast under the feet of men. Salt has an impact on what it's being applied to. You can have a baked potato with no salt and try to eat it, it's bland. There's not a whole lot of taste to a baked potato. In my opinion, without salt, butter, and sour cream. <laughs> you know, it's a plan. But you can put a little salt on there, and it makes all the difference in the world. I'm talking about examining ourselves. Are we the salt of the earth? Do we have an effect in this world as an individual, as a member of
Almighty Jehovah God had saw his delivering hand had turned to building idols and images and bowing down before and worshiping them. No, it did not happen overnight. None considered him as hard. <laughs> None considered him as hard. Have you ever met somebody that you thought to yourself, they're a know it all? <laughs> they think they know everything. <laughs> Have you ever met somebody that you thought that about? You know, I guess it ain't a good thing to say about somebody. But there are people there out in this life and in this world, they know everything. They never consider that they could be wrong. But there's not one of us, Clint, not in the highest position in the church of God that cannot afford to kneel down and to pray and say, Oh, God, help me to examine my own self. Help me to know my Lord. Help me to prove my own self. Dear Heavenly Father, that you do abide in my heart and in my life. I don't want to stray so far from God that I don't even consider in my heart whether all that I'm doing is acceptable or not to Him. <laughs> Do you know that we can get that far off course? That we can go so far that we don't even consider that the sacrifices that we're bringing are nothing but an abomination and a stink in the nostrils of God Almighty. That's what the Pharisees and scribes were guilty of. But leaving the weightier matters undone. He said that none can sit in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire. Not even consider, Sister Marla, that that wood they made an image of, half of it they just burned in the fire. That's what he's saying. And he said, Yea, also I have baked bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted flesh and eaten it. And shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? This is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah to his own people about how far off course and base they had went. They had went loco loco. <laughs> they had honestly went loco. He feedeth on ashes. A deceived heart hath turned him aside that he cannot deliver his soul nor say is there not a lie in my right hand can't even discern <clears throat> that there is a lie in his right hand that's how far off course the church in the wilderness had went But yet it seems like today we're still unwilling to stop and examine our own selves. When I read this and I, I thought, oh God, oh God, help us. Help the church of God. Help us to realize how much we need God's guidance in God's wisdom, in God's leadership in our midst. How much we need to realize that we need to examine ourselves before the Lord and ask Him to search us, to try us, and see if there be anything, any weakness in us, Clint. They, ha they had a deceived heart. 
They had caused him to turn aside. He could not, there was no way for them to deliver his own soul. And you understand that they had a lie. That all that they were doing was an abomination to God. In 1 Corinthians 11, and starting at verse 31, I know in this scripture that this specifically is talking about the Lord's Supper. But it says, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. <laughs> if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. See, in this scripture, he was encouraging them to examine their self before they partook of the Lord's Supper. The importance of knowing that before they partook of the, the blood and the bread, that they knew and had judged their own selves that they were what they needed to be before God. And on in this same chapter, he tells them that there was many sick among them. Why? Because they had partaken unworthily. He tells them there are many sick among you. Misleading because they had partaken of the Lord's Supper unworthily. But he told them if you judge yourselves, you will not be judged. <laughs> we judge ourselves how? Yes, by my standards? <laughs> judge our, ourselves by ourselves? What's the word say about that? No, not wise. Don't, don't, brother Nick, <laughs> don't judge yourself by myself or them. Your pastor, don't do that. Judge yourself by what? Word. The word right. of God. Amen. If you would judge yourselves, you would not be judged. Because of this, many are sick among you. We can afford to stop and, and look at ourselves, Clint. And examine ourselves to see where we stand. Where are we with God? Is he pleased with me? He goes on and he says, but when we are judged, hey, we will be judged. <laughs> when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. <coughs> In Hebrews 12, we want to talk, we're sort of taking a turn in the road here. We talked about judging ourselves and the importance of us examining our own selves and the, the negative side effect we would have if we don't judge ourselves. But the Bible says that we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Now, at the time that Isaiah, uh, Isaiah was prophesied, God had reached out to his people many times before they had gotten that far, of course. <laughs> he reached out to them many times. He had judged them, Cliff, many times. But what? They would not hear. We're talking about the chastisement of the Lord. In Hebrews 12, 6 through 11, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. There's not a one. He said, every son whom he receiveth, he chasteneth and he scourgeth. If we endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? get reproved? Who doesn't get rebuked? We need to ask ourselves, have we ever been chastened? 
nothing by the Lord? Whom he loveth, he chasteneth. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. In the commentary it said, to suffer to go on in sin or disobedience without rebuke is a sad sign of alienation from God. You know, Clint, sometimes when growing up, my mom felt a need to whip me with the belt. But sometimes she, I might put my hand on something, slap my hand. And she'd just slap my hand. In other words, don't do that, <laughs> whatever I was reaching for. That's chastisement. That's correction. That's reproof. It wasn't always a good old beating. I, I, had, I might not always say beating. Some people take that so wrong nowadays. I called it a beating. I got whooped real good. I knew what it was to get a whooping. My mom would bleed in whooping us. Usually, if she would and just narrowed down to one, if she couldn't figure out who had done it, and no one would confess, all four of us would get lined up because she didn't know who had done the thing. And wasn't nobody willing to step up and say it was me. Which sort of seemed crazy, you know, in a way now that I think about it. But I'll never forget, you know what I always wanted to do? To get to the head of the bed and hold on to the pillow. Because I knew what was getting ready to come. And for some reason, to hold on to that pillow meant something to me. You know? But she felt a need to chastise us. And to reprove us when we were doing wrong. Well, the word of God tells us. That whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. <laughs> whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. But nobody <laughs> wants to be chastened. <laughs> nobody wants to be told, no, that's not right. This is the right way. This is the right way to do this. <laughs> they don't want to be. They don't want to be. They don't want to be corrected by God. That was what was in Israel's heart. They had went so far, so far from God. They were worshiping wood that they had made out of their own hands. And now they couldn't even understand or see their own wrongness and their doings and their actions. They couldn't even see their hearts were deceived. That's what happens when we're unwilling to set the chest in the hand of God. In our lives. I never went to my mom and said, will you whip me today? I really hadn't had a whoop in a long time, but could you whip me today? I miss it. <laughs> we don't do that, do we? But when she knew it was time, she whooped me. And she let me know what I was doing was wrong and that this was the right way. And most of the time, Brother Nick, it didn't take long for I guess what? Straightened up. I didn't have a dad around to whoop us. A lot of people say, you know, they didn't feel any fear about mama whooping them. But my mama had a heavy hand. <laughs> she knew how to discipline. And I'm thankful for that today. Because we live in a world, if people have a choice, they'd rather go to a place that will tell them a lie and that their souls would be damned throughout eternity than to hear the undulterated pure word of God and the chastened hand of God in their lives because nobody wants to know the truth. Nobody wants to be chastened. Everybody wants to be told, you're a good guy, you're going to heaven. And hell's going to be full of people that have believed that lie. And their hearts have been deceived because they had rather believe a lie 
than to embrace and accept the truth in their hearts. That's a dangerous place to be. When you drug or believe a lie, be damned when you accept the chastened hand and work of God in your life, Clear. When we left here today, Clear was talking about his message, and we were talking about trusting in the Lord. And I don't think your mom is saying this. I ain't trying to plant roses on him or nothing. I'm just telling you what he said in the truth. He said, but the Lord has shown me in this study how I need to move up. Now, what good is it for Clint to get up here and preach all this to us and walk out the door and say, I hope they heard what I said today. <laughs> what about me? What about me examining myself? How, what about me knowing my heart, proving my own self clear? Right. We're in dangerous ground when we think we don't need the word. It doesn't apply to me. Yes, ma'am, it does apply to me, Clint. He told him, he said, if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. To be illegitimate <laughs> is what it means. Nope. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. And we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits? And what does that last part say? Amen. And live. <laughs> and live.
righteousness unto them that are exercised there. The truth of the matter, Clint, even in the flesh, it wasn't in vain for Mama to whoop us. Because you know why? For a little while we straightened up and wasn't no problem to her. Because she had corrected us. <laughs> That's the same way it is with the chastisement of the Lord. You know, for at the time it seems to be grievous, not joyous. But nevertheless, afterward, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. Revelations 3 and 19. As many as I love. As many as I love. I rebuke and chasten. That doesn't leave any of us out. <laughs> There is no body who does not need chastening and rebuking from God. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. I want to encourage us tonight to examine ourselves. To know ourselves, to prove our own self, that Jesus Christ be in us, lest we be reprobate. We can drift so far from God <clears throat> that our hearts can be so deceived, Clint, that we don't know what's right and wrong anymore. Amen. What's acceptable and what's not acceptable with God. When you get to that place, you're on dangerous ground. I don't want to stray from the Lord, but I want to be willing to accept the chastisement of the Lord. I know that it is for my good, Sister Frankie. I didn't think that when I was growing up, all that, that I had to go through was for my good. I really couldn't see the good in it, you know. But today, looking back, Clint, I can see the good in everything that my mama did to try to teach us. I can see because I see the world today. Our children are left to themselves. You know, they don't have moms and dads at home. Everybody thinks it's an awful thing to spank a child, you know. Everybody thinks it's awful. But I tell you what, this generation, I hate to see the next one. That's to come because they're not going to know. Right? Each generation gets further and further away from no one this right here. <laughs> From knowing the truth of the Lord, the Word of God. I don't want to drift away. I don't want to harden my heart to the Lord. I don't want to become as Israel did. That they were worshiping idols that they made with their own hands and couldn't even understand that they had drifted from God. And that that piece of wood they were worshiping and they were praying to was not going to work in their behalf and hear their prayer. But it's important. If they had yielded to God, Clint, and to ch God's chastisement, they would not have been where they were. For we read in Isaiah 44, but they hardened their hearts, mm -hmm. and they were stiff-necked people. Right. We can't afford to be that way. Time, I thought about bringing <coughs> one of those sand timers where you flip, because hourglass, that's what's happened. That's how short time is. I don't think we realize it, but we don't have much longer in this life. God is wrapping it up. It, everything is on his timetable, Clint. And it we're, we're right on time. <laughs> I told Clint today, we were talking, I said, you don't think we're on time because you don't see what you think we should be seeing. But we are right on time. And the Bible says that he will do a quick work. He's going to wrap it up. And when he says enough is enough, guess what? It will be enough. And there will be no more time to get things right. I don't want to be a drifting away from the Lord. Not now. I know that if I'll just hold on a little bit longer, if I'll just be faithful, if I'll just pray and seek the Lord and be willing to allow God to have his perfect work in my life, if I'll hold on, 
we're going to be in heaven one day rejoicing throughout eternity. And that is my desire to live with you.